Good evening, all. We have a diverse audience of distinguished invitees, policy makers, policy implementers, the development community, social workers, researchers, women's rights advocates, public figures, social media influencers, and many more with us here today. Thank you very much for accepting Advocata's invitation and being with us here in person. We highly appreciate it. As we all know, tomorrow is International Women's Day. And Advocata, as a public policy think tank that focuses on economic policy, have decided to dedicate this year's Women's Day to bring awareness to women's economic freedom, especially to discuss whether the Sri Lankan woman is given the opportunity in terms of the country's policy and legal framework to attain economic freedom. This research effort is broadly titled Freedom for Her. To briefly define what economic freedom is, as stated by the Economic Freedom Index, it is the fundamental right of every human to control his or her own labor and property. In an economically free society, individuals are free to work, produce, consume, and invest in any way they please. Therefore, the more free economies are, the more they are seen to be able to empower their women to make their own choices and decisions. To understand if women in Sri Lanka are given equal opportunity to work or to enter and remain in the labor force, the Advocata Institute has conducted a study to understand if the legal, legal framework of Sri Lanka enables or hampers a woman's willingness to work. Our report is titled, Sri Lanka's Gender Discriminatory Labor Laws and Female Labor Force Participation. To give you a little context, Sri Lanka's female labor force participation oscillated between 30 to 37% for the past few decades. 2020 recorded a female labor force participation rate of 32%. The second quarter of 2021 reported a female labor force participation rate of 30.9%, which is a significant decrease from the first quarter of 2021, which reported a female labor force participation rate of 33.4%. While there are many contributory factors for Sri Lanka's low female labor force participation, we have decided to explore the role of labor laws that discourage women from entering and remaining in the labor force. As a growing body of research, including the World Bank's Women, Business and the Law Index, show that greater equality under the law is associated with more women participating in the labor force. Therefore, we have looked into the lack of reference to part-time and flexible employment in the existing labor law, time restrictions on employing women at night, dearth of legal provisions for sexual harassment in employment, and restrictions on overtime work for women as legal obstacles that discourage women from entering and remaining in the labor force. This study has identified these four legal constraints to be easier to tackle in terms of legal reforms in Sri Lanka. If you wish to obtain a copy of the report, please do give your details, including your email address and your phone number to one of our Advocata staff members at the registration booth. Without further ado, I would like to invite our researchers, Tiloka Yapa, Tiffany Hall, and Sumia Sally, who have worked tirelessly on this report for the past few months. And I would also like to thank Shanali Bamaranage, Jessica Piris, Anuka Ratnaika for their research contributions for this report. Now I would like to invite uh, Tiffany Hull to take over the stage to present uh, our audience with their research findings. I would also like to remind you that after the presentation is concluded, we will commence the panel discussion with our distinguished panelists, Dr. Ramani Gunatilaka, Honorable Thalata Atakaurala, Ms. Ayamu Fernando, and Ms. Tanuja Jayawardana. Tiffany, over to you. Thank you, Satya. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here today. I begin today's presentation with a very sensitive area, that is sexual harassment in the workplace. The problem that exists in Sri Lanka's legal framework is that sexual harassment in the workplace isn't addressing any existing labor laws. The only provision that does talk about sexual harassment is section 345 of the Penal Code of Sri Lanka. Sexual harassment, according to the Penal Code, includes words or actions, or the cause of annoyance. It also explains it to be by a person of authority in a workplace or any other place. 
You might wonder, after I mention this, what is the problem in the law if sexual harassment has been mentioned in some degree in the legal, legal framework? This is because sexual harassment in the workplace is, ad is addressed in a, a criminal context in Sri Lanka. This means that complaints need to be made to the police and are potentially followed by lengthy court proceedings and it requires a higher burden of proof in order for the victim to access justice. Because of this, cases go unreported. To prove the inadequacy in the current legal framework to address sexual harassment in the workplace, this research points out a few statistics. A sample survey conducted by the Sri Lanka Medical Association in 2011 points out and finds out that out of 1,344 female free trade zone workers, 57% have said, stated that they are faced with sexual harassment. The same survey uh, reveals that out of 321 female industrial workers, 62.3% have stated that they have been faced with some form of unwanted sexual advance. Lastly, the International Labour Organization administered a questionnaire among 500 women in 2016, the majority of which who were unemployed at the time. The sample survey, sorry, out of this, three-fifths of those women have pointed out that they would be willing to work if they were assured that they would not be vulnerable to sexual harassment in the, first place, in the workplace. These numbers highlight the importance of addressing sexual harassment in the workplace in civil law. This would mean that no police involvement is required to make a complaint it could be resolved through alternative means such as conciliation, arbitration, and even the labor tribunal, which would require a lower burden of proof to win their case. We witness a positive outcome in India. Upon the introduction of the Sexual Harassment at Workplace for Women at Workplace Act 2013, every employer with over 10 workers were required to set up an internal committee to handle complaints within the workplace and initiate proactive measures to prevent sexual harassment within their workplaces. The 2013 Act also requires a local committee to be appointed in every district in the country, through which they were empowered to handle sexual harassment complaints by means of conciliation. Within a year of introducing the 2013 Act, the National Commission for Women reported a 35% increase in complaints being made. However, a survey conducted by the Indian Bar Association among 6,047 working men and women revealed that 65.2% um, of the companies did not actually follow the legal framework required. Further, 33.3% of those women, working women, stated that their complaints weren't dealt with fairly. This shows us that in order to make meaningful change with legal reform, there needs to be a compliance mechanism. As Sri Lanka is a signatory to the CEDAW Convention and the International Covenant of economic, and, economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which uphold the right to safe and healthy working conditions, legal reform is urged. Accordingly, this research proposes that the Industrial Disputes Act in Sri Lanka be amended to expand the def definition of work-related disputes so as to include sexual harassment. Further, the Industrial Disputes Act needs to introduce a regulation within their statute through which an office can be appointed within the Labor Department to specifically handle sexual harassment complaints. This office would also be empowered to overlook internal mechanisms set up by private companies. In addition to the reforms that we suggest under the Industrial Disputes Act, we also propose supplementary reforms within the existing uh, employment statutes. This includes the Shop and Office Employees Act, the Factories Ordinance, the Employment of Women, Young Persons and Children Act, and the Wages Board Ordinance to specifically address sexual harassment in the workplace. 
The second branch of this report concerns part-time work. Before I dive into the problems existing in the law, I want to explain to you how this relates to women. The 2019 World Bank data illustrates that women are twice more likely to engage in part-time work than men. That is, 33.82% of women engage in part-time work, whilst 19.87% of men engage in the same. Although there have been many factors that contribute to this statistic, this research has identified that women bear a greater burden of unpaid care work. For instance, the 2017 Department of Census and Statistics data point out that female participation rate for unpaid domestic services for household and family members is at 86.4%. Whilst the same for unpaid caregiving services for household and family members amounts to 38.4% in 2016. So, how has the law failed to accommodate more flexible working arrangements for women who, who bear the greater care caregiving burden? The existing labor laws in Sri Lanka fail to recognize the concept of part-time work. How does this relate to us? In other words, this means that a part-time worker would be considered a full-time worker under the existing labor laws. This means less working hours for the same entitlements. And because we drew the connection between part-time work and women, employers are inhibited from employing and hiring women who prefer flexible and part-time working arrangements. As an alternative, women are, are then pushed to the informal sector. This means that they are more susceptible to job loss and insecurity and are unable to approach formal banking institutions to obtain loans. I will now move on to explain to you all the entitlements in which a part-time worker would fall within as a full-time worker. In terms of holidays and rest hours, the Wages Board Ordinance, the Shop and Office Act, and the Employment of Women, Young Person, and Children Act, and the, Factories and the Factories Ordinance fail to prescribe the minimum hours required to qualify as a full-time worker, which means that they would again, part-time workers again would, be, would fall and be treated as a full-time worker, thereby inhibiting part-time workers to get and secure employment. The Termination of Employment of Worker Act entitles workers to compensation upon unfair dismissal, provided that they work for over 180 days. However, this statute again fails to prescribe the minimum hours of work during those 180 days. Even a, therefore, even a part-time worker would be entitled to compensation. Finally, the Payment of Gratuity Act entitles an employee to social security based on their last drawn salary provided that they have worked for an uninterrupted period of five years. As the Act fails to distinguish between full-time workers and part-time workers, this would again entitle part-time workers to the same. This Act again would, dis uh, would disadvantage part-time workers uh, who were originally full-time workers if they wish to, uh, wish to in, uh, claim their social security based on their based on their last on salary, that is, their part-time work salary. Upon understanding the detrimental, upon understanding the detrimental impacts of non-recognition of part-time work, this research urges part-time work to be recognized in the existing labor laws in Sri Lanka. Lessons can be learned from Austria. The introduction of the Working Time Act and the Temporary Employment Act in Austria was instrumental in boosting part-time employment in the country. The World Bank data points out that Austria has reached a high employment rate, high part-time employment rate of 65.5% in 2020. As Sri Lanka is a signatory to the Employment Policy Convention number 122, which advocates that employees should have the freedom of choice and fullest opportunity to engage in work, work they're suited for, this research urges reform. As such, 
The Shop and Office Act and the Wages Board Ordinance should be amended to entitle employees who work less than the maximum hours of a full-time worker to annual and casual leave in proportion to the number of hours they work. This would incentivize employees from hiring part-time workers as their entitlements now would be uh, proportionate to the number of hours worked. Secondly, amend the calculation of the social secu security under the Payment of Gratuity Act to consider an employee's last drawn salary as a full-time worker and as a part-time worker individually. In terms of the long run, this research proposes that a separate statute be introduced specifically governing and recognizing part-time and flexible working arrangements. Thank you. I will now give the mic to my colleague Tiloka Yapa for her presentation. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, we will now discuss the law pertaining to night work restrictions on women in Sri Lanka. So to give you a brief overview to this section, we have discussed three major laws. That's the Shop and Office Employees Act. the Employment of Women, Young Persons and Children Act, and the Factories Ordinance. And we've divided the brief into three major industries, that's the IT and the BPM sector, the tourism sector, and the manufacturing sector. So something to keep in mind when we look at the laws that we consider to be discriminatory against women is that these laws at the time that they have been drafted was intending to protect women. However, right now they indirectly discriminate against women. Moving on to the first industry that we discussed under night work, work at night restrictions on the women in the IT and the BPM sector. To explain the law, the restriction that applies to women in the IT and the BPM sector is that women under the Shop and Office Employees Act are not allowed to work past 8 p.m. However, there are two exceptions to this rule. Under Section 10 b one of the Act, Women can be employed in hotels and restaurants after 10 p.m. Under Regulation 3 of the Act, women working as ground hostesses, linen room, ladies' cloak room, and laboratory attendants can be work, can are exempted. So despite this restriction by law, women in the industry currently work past 8 p.m. So how do firms in the IT and the BPM sector currently operate at night? This is by way of a concept called administrative relaxations, which is actually outside the formal law. The Department of Labor does not officially recognize this concept. However, something to note is that when you look at the 2020 annual performance report of the Labor Department, it shows that only 57 cases have been filed and 44 cases have been completed under the Shop and Office Employees Act as opposed to cases filed and completed under other acts such as the Employees Provident Fund Act and the Gratuity Act. So what is the problem? So when you look at the law on one hand, it restricts women from working after 8 p.m., while on the other hand, firms in the sector already employ women after 8. So there's a clear ambiguity in the law which could ultimately discourage investors who would look into investing in this industry because um, something that investors look look for when they look into investing in a particular industry is a clear and an enforceable legal framework moving on to the next industry work at night restrictions for women in the tourism sector we've specially focused on women working in the hotels and restaurants so the restriction that applies is that under the Shop and Office Employees Act, women are not allowed to work past, eight, past 10 p.m. However, again, there are exceptions to this rule. Under Regulation 3, women working in residential hotels as receptionists have been exempted. The problem here is that, as per the latest available data, in 2018, women represented less than 10% of the tourism industry. However, limited flexible working options 
have been identified as a factor that contributes to low female engagement in the sector. With that, I move on to work at night restrictions on women in the manufacturing industry. So when it comes to this industry, females are allowed to work at night. However, the factory's ordinance and the Employment of Women, Young Persons and Children Act restrict women from working more than 10 days at night. However, again, there are two exceptions to this rule. That is under Section 2B of the Employment of Women, Young Persons and Children Act. Women holding positions of a managerial, technical character, health and welfare services have been exempted. Under Section 74 of the Factories Ordinance, women in positions of management have also been exempted from this rule. So why should we reform? Two major reasons. Firstly, it curtails the choice of a woman to choose their preferred time to work. And secondly, it limits their earning capacity because by law, when a female is allowed to work at night, they are paid 1.5 times the normal rate of payment. Moving on to international obligations, this violates two major um, conventions. Firstly, it violates the discrimination, employment and occupation convention by the ILO. And secondly, it uh, violates the CEDO convention, which upholds the fundamental principles of non-discrimination and equality of opportunity and treatment. As lessons from the region, we spoke to the Center for Public Policy Research that pioneered the removal of night work restrictions in Kerala. And before the law was amended, in Kerala, under the Kerala Shops and Establishments Act, women were not allowed to work before 6 a.m. and after 7 p.m. However, after the amendment in 2018, the act allowed women to employ at, be employed at night between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m., provided that the employer obtains the consent of the employee. It also mandates the employer to provide adequate protection and transportation to females working at night. Moving on to our reform recommendations, as legislative reforms, we, uh, research suggests that we remove night work restrictions on women imposed by the Shop and Office Employees Act, the Factories Ordinance, and the Employment of Women, Young Persons, and Children Act. In removing restrictions to avoid exploitation of women, we suggest that lawmakers should comply with adequate safeguards, especially the need to obtain consent of women to work at night. With that, I would now like to pass it to Sumeya Sali. Thank you very much, Siloka. Uh, so lastly, I will be looking at the uh, overtime work for women in Sri Lanka. So the Shop and Office um, Employees Act is what governs the employment of female employees uh, in the private sector in Sri Lanka. And under this act, female employees are permitted to work for a maximum of nine hours per day. And they cannot work beyond this limit. However, on the other hand, male employees are permitted to work the standard working hours of nine hours, and in addition to this, they are allowed to work 12 hours of overtime per week. There are certain exceptions uh, to females who are employed in residential hotels, clubs, and other places of entertainment, and in addition to this, uh, shops that are located in airports uh, up until 10 p.m. under specific conditions. Although the Shop and Office Employees Act does, uh, does not permit overtime work, what we can see is that in reality, a large number of employees actually work overtime. So if we are to look at a few numbers, we can see that according to the 2020 Labor Force Survey, 56.2% of uh, firms worked overtime. And according to the 2021 uh, second quarterly labor force survey, we can see that 49.8% of firms worked overtime. And finally, a study uh, in 2020 that was done by the Institute of Policy Studies revealed that 70.91% of employees uh, in uh, private hospitals worked overtime. 
And as stated uh, previously by my colleague Tiloka on uh, administrative relaxation, which is uh, uh, basically outside the scope of the law and is not recognized uh, formally by the Labor Department, applies to overtime work as well, where the law is relaxed to allow female employees to work beyond this nine-hour limitation. And uh, upon this application of administrative relaxation, employees and employers would either into, enter into a written or a verbal agreement. However, there are some um, um, issues when it comes to administrative relaxation, which is that uh, employees um, have had complaints of excessive overtime. And in addition to this, employees who have worked overtime have not been compensated for the hours worked. Uh, in 2019, uh, the Draft Employment Act was presented to the National uh, Labor uh, Advisory Council. Um, and uh, this act proposed amendments to the restrictions on overtime work, whereby re uh, proposing to remove these restrictions. However, this act was only taken up to the draft stage and was not uh, passed by the parliament. Uh, through this uh, Employment Act 2019, what we can see is there has been willingness previously uh, to uh, amend the laws on these restrictions. And when we look at lessons from the region, specifically Nepal, what we can see is in 2017, Nepal had introduced the Labor Act 2074 uh, to remove the legal restrictions on overtime for male and female employees. And through this act, female employees were allowed to work an overtime of 24 hours per week. And when we look at this graph here, we can see that uh, there has been a gradual increase of female labor force participation uh, due to the many reforms that took place in Nepal. And when we look at the international obligations, Sri Lanka is a signatory to the Discriminatory Employment and Occupation Convention 1958, number 111. And under this convention, uh, it states that there should not be uh, any discrimination in terms of employment and occupation based on sex. Um, and Sri Lanka has ratified this convention. However, overtime restrictions on female employees continue to exist. And finally, when we look into the reform recommendations that we have found through our research, what uh, we can see is that we, uh, there be a new regulation that is introduced under Section 313A of the Shop and Office Employees Regulation of Employment and Remuneration Act to allow female employees to work overtime. And similarly, along with this, uh, this regulation should include guidelines to avoid the exploitation of excessive overtime, such as uh, those guidelines under Section 2A of the Employment and Women, Young Persons, Children Act, as well as Section 67A of the Factories Ordinance. And with that, uh, I would conclude the presentation of our research, and I'd like to hand it over to Satya to kick off the panel discussion. Thank you. Before we commence the panel discussion, I would like to invite Mr. Murtaza Jafarji, Chairman of the Advocata Institute, to present a copy of the report to each of the panelists. Firstly, we'd like to hand over a copy to Honorable Thalathathu Korala, representing the Women Parliamentarians Caucus. 
The Women Parliamentarians Caucus have reached out to the Advocata Institute previously in terms of uh, gender discriminatory labor laws in Sri Lanka. And regardless of party affiliations, we do hope that these reform recommendations will be considered by the uh, caucus in the best interest of 51.6% of the population. Uh, we would now like to hand over a copy of the report to Dr. Ramani Kunatilaka. We are very honored to have you with us here today. And now we would like to present a copy to Ms. Aimee Fernando. And finally, Ms. Thanu Jajayavadana representing MAS. Thank you very much, Mr. Murtaza. Without for, thank you very much for uh, your attention uh, to the research findings of our report. We hope that you enjoyed and you uh, took away a lot in terms of the reform recommendations. And now we would like to uh, kick off the panel discussion without further ado. To introduce the panelists for the day, uh, we have Honorable Thalatha Atakorala as mentioned previously. Honorable Atakorala is a member of parliament and the Women Parliamentarians Caucus. She was appointed as the Cabinet Minister of Foreign Employment, Promotion and Welfare in 2015. Later, she was also sworn in as the Minister of Justice, becoming the first woman in, woman in Sri Lanka to hold that position. Thank you very much, Honorable Atakorala, for representing the Women Parliamentarians Caucus here today. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, then we have Dr. Ramani Gunatilaka. We are very honored to have you with us here today, Dr. Gunatilaka. Dr. Ramani Gunatilaka is an independent consultant analyzing labor markets and subjective well-being in Sri Lanka and the region. She's currently working on studies about the factors associated with the demand for women workers in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka's care economy, and access to land and women's empowerment in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramani, for being with us here today. Next, we have Ms. Ayomi Fernando. Ms. Ayomi Fernando is an attorney at law and holds a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Colombo. She counts over 27 years of experience in the legal field. She has served as a vis visiting lecturer at the Faculty of Graduate Studies at the University of Colombo and the Postgraduate Institute of Management. She served, as, she served at the Employees Federation of Ceylon, or the EFC, for over 20 years and has also held the post of Assistant Director General there. Of the many expert committees she has been a part of, she represented the EFC at the ILO's tripartite panel of experts to discuss global standards on workplace violence and was on the Ministry of Labor and Relations and Manpower's Advisory Board on Gender. Finally, we have Ms. Thanu Jajayavardhana representing MAS. We are very much happy to have you with us here today. Ms. Thanu Jajayavardhana is the Head of Women's Empowerment and Advocacy at MAS Holdings and have been with the company for over 10 years. She's an attorney at law and holds a bachelor degree in English from the University of Colombo. Without further ado, I'd like to kick off the panel uh, with Honorable Thalata Atakorala. Um, Honorable Thalata Atakorala, as a representative of the Women Parliamentarians Caucus, what are your views on on Sri Lanka's labor laws, do you think it's gender discriminatory? And as a voice that represents 51.6% po of the population, what are your biggest concerns in terms of the labor law? Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, really of labor 
where they are also working hard on it and uh, to ratify its involvement and also like uh, the uh, uh, other other things also as we say uh, where women mostly discriminated like uh, with their overtime wages then uh, uh, other issues also uh, but the thing is it's as the focus we get them to uh, the relevant authorities to uh, do whatever that has to be done because it's for presenting it to parliament be making law is not it's not in our glory so it's that we get them we force them we try to get their attention we try to like uh, get them to uh, work on it but uh, due to so many things amending law introducing new laws also not very uh, that's something that yeah. can be done in uh, uh, like oh, um, it just yeah, it takes yeah. a time and when you say little sometimes it takes such a long time because so many uh, like at the end of the uh, uh, at end of everything at the end of everything the, we have to get it passed with the uh, uh, attorney general department of the mm -hmm. country so as the caucus we have been not only about labor laws about not uh, only about other issues we have been working on so many political social and uh, environmental all all these issues we have been taking into consideration and we have been doing our uh, fullest uh, effort to bring it to the notice of all these people the the, the relevant authorities when you say labor it has to come to, from the labor base when it goes to something regarding women it has to pass from the women <coughs> ministry and its uh, the authorities with them Thank you very much, Honorable Thaltati Korala. I'd like to move on to uh, Ms. Thanu to Jayavardhana. As a leading female figure in the corporate sector, it's evident that you have a lot of insight into the practical impact of these uh, labor laws. Could you elaborate a bit on that, uh, Ms. Thanu, for us? Um, we are an industry that benefits from a massive workforce of women. So for MAS Holdings, from a very early stage, I believe we realized that there are challenges faced by women coming into the workforce. So we've always looked at how we bridge those gaps, um, what we might do from providing safe transport to nutrition and meals to awareness and education on reproductive health and rights, providing childcare facilities. We have 20 facilities right now which we're trying to do more of. But while we look at bridging gaps and addressing challenges faced by this massive population of women driving our industry, we also very keenly look at the way we work, the structures, the frameworks, the times. And something that we as an organization are really focusing on is how do we look at our shift patterns, the way we work in a way that gives as much flexibility and as much benefit to this workforce and also in a way that we can retain the talent. And when we look at that, discriminatory laws on hours, on night work, all of that poses a huge challenge for us as employers who are looking at different ways of addressing challenges that are faced by women who, as your report also shows, bear a majority of the unpaid care work. So, we are not at any point saying we should be gender blind. We need to provide facilities, infrastructure, services, policies that support women to manage this double burden, as we call it. Um, but the gender discriminatory laws, the way they are right now, are perpetuating an existing patriarchal framework that places the woman in the personal space or in the home. And the women coming into our workforce, the women working at MAS in our factories are smart, driven, capable women who are um, taking the skill development work we do and running their own businesses. Um, they're employing their husbands, they're employing their in-laws, and they're educating their children and their communities. But somehow the law is saying that these women cannot choose 
the hours they want to work um, and the flexibility that could be afforded if they had the same opportunity and, and the ability to decide along with their male counterparts. So ideally, if everyone, men, women, people of all genders had um, policies and frameworks and laws that give them choice, um, and allow them to participate um, and support them, that would help businesses, that would help communities. Um, when the law perpetuates the same stereotypes that we're trying really hard to challenge and break through, not only at MAS, but a lot of companies in the private sector, um, that doesn't help communities or businesses or women or men, I think. Thank you very much, Tanuja. I'd like to move my attention to Dr. Ramari Gunatilaka. Uh, Dr. Gunatilaka, this is an area that you've worked on extensively. Um, as an academic, how do you view Sri Lanka's labor laws? Do you think it's gender discriminatory? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I do, not intentionally. Uh, it is discriminatory by how it is implemented and also by the fact that it is outdated. Uh, society has changed, the economy has changed, uh, the class structure has changed. Uh, these laws were passed at a time when Sri Lanka was very different, uh, when the kind of jobs available were very different. Uh, and certainly I do think that in effect, they work against the employment of women because they increase the costs to a firm of employing a woman as opposed to a man. Uh, having said that, uh, I would say that we need to fix this for, for just our own enlightened self-interest. Uh, not just as women or as advocate, advocates of women's rights, but as a country, as a community and as households. Uh, that is because we are already facing a tight labor market. Uh, our population is growing old. The working age cohort share in the population is declining. If women don't enter the paid workforce, wage costs will rise and we will not be able to grow economically. So actually it is this that has turned the attention of policymakers to this issue, but I don't think they quite understand it. Uh, the other thing is even for women and, and, for, and for the government, for the taxpayers, they have been spending a lot on women's education and now women are far more educated than men, really because they are staying on in school while men go into the labor market. So if with all this education they are going to stay back at, stay at home and look after their children, society is not getting what it spent in investing in their education. Uh, so, so that is a waste of resources. For women themselves who are growing old, who are outliving their men, uh, if they haven't worked and earned and they are not able to do it, uh, they are going to remain dependent on their relatives for their old age. So I think when you look at the situation, if you look at the employment of women, there are demand side factors and supply side factors. This one, uh, labor laws, is affecting the demand for women workers and recently Professor Sunil Chandrasri and I did a study for uh, UN women using both primary and secondary data and we found that there is a statistically significant effect, a negative effect uh, on labor demand for women, relative labor demand for women if employers think that labor laws in Sri Lanka make it more costly to hire women. I'm Fernando. I think Dr. Gunatilaka also touched on this. Uh, given the application of the law, uh, Ms. Ayomi, what, do you, what laws do you think are the most gender discriminatory towards women? 
I think we can all agree on that. Uh, it is the provisions preventing women from working at night, uh, which is a huge restriction because in terms of the factories ordinance and employment of women and young persons, it's only 10 nights a month with consent. Uh, and in terms of the Shop and Office Employees Act, if you look at the hours women are, are permitted to work, yes, there are certain limited categories which are excluded, and yes, there is administrative relaxation, but these are just cumbersome processes. We don't need to do this. Why not change the law, give uh, uh, women and men an equal playing field? Uh, I realize that there have to be protections, because initially, at the times these laws were passed, the idea was to protect, and we need to protect women. Like I represented an employer for many, very many years of my career. Uh, I hope that no one in the EFC exploited women, but there are plenty of companies, there are employers, especially down the, the smaller size ones, they do employ, uh, exploit the women they employ. So protections are necessary, uh, but we need to balance it so that everyone has the opportunity. And I think right now we have consent. So even if we increase the number of uh, nights a woman can work or the overtime hours a woman, a woman can do, uh, consent is something, and to make sure that there is no force, um, things like that could also be provided for. We are not just looking at a one-way street here where you just take everything out, right? That's what I think. Thank you very much, Ms. Ayumi. I'd like to move my attention to Honorable Thalatathur Atikorala once more. Um, um, Honorable Atikorala, could you explain to us the role the Women Parliamentarians Caucus play in the process of implementing laws that are gender inclusive and what kind of bottlenecks do you come across when you attempt to implement such reforms? Maybe like if it's something to do with the environment, we can, of course, we have to get the, uh, get the thing done through their ministries. So it's very like, detailed that we could do, but we are, uh, we are trying to get, doing our best to get things moved on, for the benefit of the women. And uh, now, to, as I told you earlier, uh, it's uh, mostly one of the things that we have identified. So, such a long time we take to uh, get to these laws. The prevailing it takes such a long time to do the representations, then not only us, but to take, get other people involved in it, or like we say, when it comes to labor force, it's mostly the Labor Ministry has the authority. So like that, we, uh, one of the, uh, very unfortunately, we don't have anyone, uh, any person, like any member of parliament who would do the representations to the cabinet. As it is now, we don't have a minister in charge for women affairs. So that is one, uh, uh, bottleneck that uh, we have to, I mean, there's no one to, we have, we have to be like making our representations to all these people and finally it's uh, decided by someone else. So I of course uh, strongly as caucus, we uh, believe because right now uh, the representations are done through caucus to various uh, people, but uh, when it, uh, it takes such a long time, I mean, to make it as law. So that is one of the uh, bottlenecks that uh, <laughs> we have identified. And of course, I think a balanced approach should be, um, we have to, Member of Parliament, I'd like to move on to Thanuja Jayavadana. Uh, you had MSS Women Go Beyond Effort, which is a women's empowerment platform that strives to make a difference in the lives of your female associates. So we talk about all of these gender um, inclusive laws, such as making part time possible for women, allowing women to work more than ten days in the night in the month. Uh, what what kind of real difference do you think this would make in the lives of women in in the manufacturing sector? Do, do you think these are extremely necessary to improve the um, working conditions of women? 
So, I think changing the laws, um, I, I will touch on part-time work specifically because that's a space that we really have been looking into and colleagues at the EFC know how much we connect with them. Um, MAS has a framework for part-time work, but with so much difficulty because we've recognized that as a business, we'd like to have the talent um, and the skill within our organization if men or women want to move into part-time work. It's, it's good for business to, to hold on to that talent and allow them part-time work rather than lose them from the workforce. Um, but the framework that we have, uh, we are facing so many challenges because of the way the law is. Um, and also, of course, as, as you mentioned in, in your presentation of the report, the Gratuity Act, which actively compromises the ability to provide part-time work. We have worked through all of that and found ways to have a framework, but we're not able to roll it out um, as broadly as we'd like. And all of these other discriminatory laws um, also, so changing the laws will be a step. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of other things that have to fall into place. There's a mindset change that's necessary to have more women coming into the workplace. There is infrastructure, there's childcare support that's really necessary. Um, we have maternity leave, paternity leave is, is important to change that mindset, take away that idea that women are expected to be the only childcare and home care um, responsibility holding individuals. So changing the law I think is a step and it's an essential step because the law cannot perpetuate discrimination. Um, that has to be a step that we take um, and I think exactly as Dr. Gunatilaka said, it is necessary for us as a country in terms of mindset change and I firmly believe that if the law is changed and we communicate it effectively and sensitively, it will also influence cultural change and social change because it's we need to have that mindset change and while the law is not supporting that, it doesn't help. So if, you, if we do manage to make these changes and communicate it in a way where we make people understand why it's necessary for business, for the economy and for communities to have women coming into the workforce, um, that will, I strongly believe, uh, influence a lot of other change that we need. So law is one piece but essential. Very much. I'd like to move our attention to Dr. Ramani Gunatilakan. Uh, Dr. Ramani is speaking about the women, business, and the law indicator by the World Bank. Um, the report states that with the increase of legal gender equality, female labor force participation also increases. The report also concludes that the more equal societies are, more resilient their economies become. Uh, considering Sri Lanka's current economic condition, how important do you think is female labor force participation, and do you think um, gender equality makes economic sense for Sri Lanka? at the moment? I think it is fundamental. Uh, I mean, our e economy is in, in a crisis, uh, a crisis of the kind we haven't experienced before. Uh, we need to resuscitate growth, and we need to resuscitate, very importantly, exports. Uh, and of course, we need to show up incomes which have collapsed uh, during the la these last two years. Uh, I would say that reforming these labor laws is a kind of, they are a kind of low hanging fruit. Uh, as Tanuja says, uh, mindsets to change mindsets takes a long time. Uh, but this is possible and it can be done if we, we kind of get out of this, this mire, this sort of swamp of uh, indecision, paralysis. We, we are in a situation of policy paralysis uh, and, and we need to crawl out of that. And if we change the laws, and show investors that they can hire women, 
for the kind of work they would like women to do, uh, it would help investment, it would help expand employment. Uh, also, I, I mean look at it in this sense, uh, just take part time work. If you allow part time work, then young people, students would be able to get some experience of a workplace, how things function, develop networks and start their own businesses. Uh, women themselves can do it and, and actually women want to start their own businesses because then they can manage to, to juggle this, this terrible uh, double burden. So I, I do think that this is necessary though having said that, I mean I, I looked at the audience today and I realized that most people are, are much younger than I am and I started my research my work as a researcher talking about labor laws many years ago and I don't see that we have moved and I'm sorry I feel my generation has dropped the ball but I'm encouraged by, there are, by, by the fact that there are so many more younger researchers, women, you may be able to get the job done. Dominique for those very encouraging words. Uh, I'd like to move on to Ms. Ayomi Fernando. Uh, Ms. Ayomi, as someone who's been with the Employers Federation for many years, what reforms do you think will increase women's willingness to work? Because it's important that women are willing to enter the labor force and retain in the labor force. That's a difficult one, Satya. Um, changing the law, I think you said, was the low-hanging fruit. Uh, willingness is something else entirely. So there will be so many socio-economic conditions, cultural, everything. Uh, I remember someone once saying, uh, you cannot legislate that you will have a happy marriage, right? So like that, how can you legislate willingness? So I don't know whether this is something that you can do to legal reform. Uh, but on the other side, I have to say like, okay, maybe if the protections, now I know we are not talking about more laws and the employer being called upon to spend more and invest more. And now I can freely say this because I no longer work for the Employers Federation, but willingness will probably have to be linked to some kind of tangible benefit that they see in working. Right now, all of us as women, and uh, this country paid for my education, right? I didn't spend a cent on it, so I owe this country. That's why I worked. Right? Uh, so like that, there are so many women, I'm sure, who are uh, mindful of this. They would like to work, but they also have certain conditions that they have to, certain situations that they are in which may preclude it. Um, so you have to kind of get them there and keep them there simply. Right? So you might need to incentivize at some point, but I know this is not the time to do that because it's a desperate battle to survive, right? Right now, I have lived through two insurrections, one war, COVID and never has it ever been so bad. I hope I will never see anything worse. Um, so right now, I don't know whether you can ask who is going to incentivize this for God's sake. The government doesn't have money. The employers don't have money. Who, how can we set this uh, going? Um, so it's, I would say, almost impossible, Satya, the question you asked me. But in terms of the laws and the proposals you all have come up with, I think it has quite, a, a, at least the measures that give women an equal, more equal opportunities there whether they are going to take it or not, maybe desperation will drive them to it. Uh, but then on the other hand, if you kill the employer by maybe taxing more or even right now, I have heard a recent very scary interpretation that some labor authorities are taking on fixed term contracts. I mean, that will make it virtually impossible to do business. So <laughs> that's what I can say, I'm afraid. Not a very encouraging answer, but... Um, that's the way it is, or the way I see it. Thank you very much, Ms. Ayomi. I think we have a very large audience here with us today in person. If you have any questions, you are more than encouraged to direct it to our uh, distinguished panel here today. And uh, please, it's your time to ask any questions. If you do have any, please do raise your hand and we will provide you with a microphone. We have one question over there, if we can provide uh, them with a microphone. Excuse me. 
Um, my question is to MP Thalata Tukorala. Um, I think we have heard over and over how the process of passing the law is how, how cumbersome it is. I think I saw it um, as an excuse that was given by uh, Justice Minister at, again at a uh, webinar on reforming labor laws to benefit women. But yet, I believe that if there's a will, there's a way, because there are certain laws that were passed recently in such a hurry. I want to know that um, ha has there been at least some initiation or at least a private member bill to reform these laws? Because I think it's very important that there's this top-down um, effect on um, reforming these um, very archaic laws. So has there been at least a pri private member bill? Let's say there, there's no minister, which is a tragedy, but I think even a private member, uh, member can present a bill. Um, has it been done? Has anything been done? Have you uh, at least started that cumbersome process? To be honest, uh, not uh, really, because uh, you know, just to bring a private member bill for this kind of thing is uh, not practical. Because whenever it's, it's, you see, it's the, uh, the, the deciding person is somewhere else and it's not for us to bring like when when it comes to uh, national issues when it comes to like when when it comes to labor force when it comes to we'll say uh, economic uh, reforms it's it's not possible for us to bring any uh, private member uh, motions but also i have to tell you that as the caucus we like uh, Maybe that we try to push them, we try to, uh, now as the caucus we are working hard on it, but then uh, as I told you, right now during this recent past, there are so many other issues that is beyond our control that uh, everything is not in a place. So I just have to tell you that, uh, to be very honestly, that uh, not Right now, it's happening. I think Professor Samarajeeva also had one question. If we can get a microphone over here. My question is mostly, actually, I guess, I guess the best response would be from Advocate itself. Um, two gaps in the in the in the report. One is I've been on uh, interview panels where it has been explicitly brought up, and I have overruled them, that uh, hiring women would cause a pro at a certain age group would cause problems for the organisation because of the maternity provisions, which is in the government it's not an un unfunded mandate, but in the private sector it's an unfunded mandate. Now these days I would hesitate to recommend that we fund any additional initiatives. But I think that's an important factor in employ in uh, hiring women. Uh, and I wonder why that was not covered in the report. The second one, I think uh, Honorable Atukorhala may have some views on this. I believe there is specific discrimination against women who wish to work abroad with people going into their homes and taking information and looking to see whether there's a well uh, various things that don't apply to men, which I have written about, which I've said is outright discriminatory. Uh, there have been periodic calls for women being prohibited from leaving the country. Uh, I wonder why these things were left out of the report. I think uh, the research uh, uh, report focused on areas that were selected. Uh, so therefore, these areas we very much acknowledge that they are gender discriminatory. However, we have uh, we have chosen a few areas that we chose to limit the research to. But however, in the future, we do wish to uh, explore these areas as well in terms of uh, the label, in terms of law, and how it's gender discriminatory towards women. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, I think Professor Samarjeeva, you had another. No, Yes, of course. It's uh, about these migrant workers you're referring to. Uh, <laughs> Professor, it's something like this. I, I know what you are like. It's, uh, <laughs> it has become a, such a big uh, social issue when parents leave uh, small children and then, of course, children 
about uh, uh, below five years that they go abroad and the, the, it has become a such a big social issue and I have been to the areas in the eastern province and north central province where most of these migrant workers uh, are from and uh, to be like uh, uh, really uh, it's about the family background report you are referring to yeah so uh, recently I heard that they have relaxed some of the uh, uh, they, what they had in the report but uh, I personally, this is not the caucus, uh, what the caucus think or like the government thing, but I personally think because I was involved in it at very personal level, you can't just even imagine about the social issues. Because the, most of these women go abroad just to get a house on their own, just to build a house or for their children's education. But after some time, when they come back, they have lost everything. So, it's the family background report is needed not only to give approval, but we, we during the last government, uh, there was a welfare scheme, like uh, how the remittances are being used, how about the children's education. Because, you know, in, in like uh, uh, all over the country, 30, uh, 30 331 divisional secretary officers had more than 1,100 graduates working as development officers without any work. But then they were allocated all these families. They were divided into like within the divisional secretary into Gramani Radharis and all that. And uh, it was really a follow-up uh, uh, program when women go like how to to take care of the children, then about their education, then remittances, then their children, the uh, uh, elderly children, how they get involved, and especially about the husbands. You know, sometimes it's so sad to say, I mean, in, at a forum like this, when she comes back, either the husband is gone with another woman, or so it's always it's, it's a it's a big issue in those areas about the small children. So that is why we were particularly about uh, getting this FBR done. But I also suggest that, as uh, Dr. Samarajiva says, you all have to if it, it to be a like uh, very. Uh, we talk about their remittances. We talk about their dollars. But then we never no one knows about their. Uh, lives, the chill, how the children suffer and how the school drops, the amount of school drops, all that. So I think uh, it's, uh, that, that will be very worthwhile if you try to do something on behalf of the migrant workers also to do a research like this, that will be very useful. To take that into consideration, I'd like to move on to Ms. Thanu to Jayawadana. I think Professor Samraji was touched on maternity leave benefits. If you have any comments, uh, um, no, not specifically on the maternity leave benefits. I, I understand what, what you're bringing up. For organizations like MAS Holdings, um, it's built into our business structure. It's not a question for us because we've organized ourselves in a way where we have taken maternity leave into consideration. We, for us, what we say is we benefit so much from a female labor force. Maternity leave and that cost um, is worthwhile. Um, we value that benefit. We have women working with us for 10, 20 years. Um, so that time that's given for maternity and the cost that we bear um, is very much part of our business plan and it's structured. But I understand that it's not the same uh, for all private sector parties, for all or for organizations of different sizes. For us, it's always been built into our, our strategy and that's how we've grown. Um, but I do want to say something positive to that question you brought up about what can we do about the willingness of women to work. Um, organizations like ours, MAS Holdings, but I also know a lot of other companies uh, in the private sector have recognized the importance of the um, contribution that women make. The educated female population, um, the skilled worker who works in our factory, works in our offices, 
and a lot of companies are willing to look at things like childcare, flexible work arrangements, despite the difficulties with the law. Uh, so if the law would support us, it would make the work we do um, easier, a little more streamlined. Uh, but on a positive note, there are companies that recognize it. It's not that we're trying to do a favor for women. Um, we need the talent. So I, I hope more businesses will see that. Uh, and while it is a difficult time, everyone's struggling um, with the business realities and the financial realities, we are committed to doing as much as we can um, as private sector to support women because women, it's not that women don't want to work. It is because it's difficult. They don't have proper childcare support. They don't have enough flexibility to manage everything that they have to. Uh, so we've decided that it's not good enough for us to say that's just how it is. Um, it's a long journey and it's not straightforward, but I, I wanted to just share that. Thank you very much. I'd like to move on to, once again, to Honorable Thalata Dukorala. Um, Member of Parliament, we do know that the Women Parliamentarians Caucus was actively working on ratifying ILO C-190 that promotes a work environment that is free of violence and harassment. My question to you is, what reforms did the caucus identify as necessary to achieve uh, this equality uh, under the law? Yeah, really about this uh, harassment at workplaces. It's uh, not only regarding women, but uh, despite of uh, gender, it's uh, male, female, both. But uh, it's again that I have to, well, we, we are in, uh, trying to get it ratified and it's with the Labour Minister and he has to, his concerns are very much bigger than ours. So, uh, I again think it will take some time and we have uh, uh, given it to the relevant authorities. I, I of course, uh, can't say anything about because in a different way to Dr. Ramani Gunatilaka. Uh, as we've been speaking, Dr. Gunatilaka, Sri Lanka is a signatory to many international conventions such as CEDAW. However, despite these commitments we've made, there are uh, contradictions in the labor law. Where do you think Sri Lanka stands in terms of these commitments that we make internationally? Well, I mean, we tick the box and sign this convention and that convention. I mean, that's all very well. But when it comes to implementation, it's a different thing altogether. And in fact, I would like to touch on, on, on some of the issues raised by the previous speakers. This issue of migrant workers, for example. Of course, there are terrible social costs. But why do these women go? Uh, they go because they can't earn enough money. The economy has not grown. Skills have not been developed investment has not been sought. So basically, they go because of desperation. And what, is, what do governments, successive governments do? They preach about women having to, you know, look after children and uh, all that. But then they are waiting uh, eagerly for the remittances. Why they can't cover their, their budgets? Uh, uh, I mean, what is this hypocrisy? Uh, that, that, that is what I would like to know. I mean, you, you uh, cry for women uh, at one time and then you don't manage the economy and then you send these women off and wait for the dollars. I, I just can't understand this. And we have been doing this kind of contradictory, you, you know, no picture, what, no vision of where we want to go. And, and uh, we are stuck in the same place. And we are not even stuck in the same place. We are going back. Uh, so, so I really do think that we need to, to get out of this, this rut we are in. And, and, and uh, imagine uh, a, fu a future in an informed way. Having said that, I have to say that while uh, private sector firms are very quick to blame the government, and of course it should be blame, blamed. Uh, not this government only, successive governments, because they have just let these issues fester and not done anything about it, right? I don't think, I, I'm, I, I'm sure MAS is doing a lot, but generally the private sector also has its problems. Now that study that Professor Sunil Chandrasiri and I did, we uh, surveyed 566 firms and one issue which came up as the largest, most statistically significant factor 
in reducing the demand for female labor is male employers. You know, so, so within private sector firms, women don't move up to managerial levels or else they don't recruit women. How many of even the top, the, the boards of the top companies in Sri Lanka have women? So, so I, I mean, I do think that while the government has its sins, the private sector is not blameless at all. We have to fix it everywhere. Thank you very much, Dr. Gunatilaka. I'd like to move on to Ms. Tanuja. Um, now, could you brief us a bit about the measures that have been adopted within your organization or in the private sector to mitigate the impact of these labor laws on women? Um, for us in the manufacturing industry, and I would say for the apparel industry, um, we have looked at headcounts, shift patterns, and organized ourselves in a way that we manage. And also for MAS, I think, mainly considering the kind of work that we do um, and being in the apparel industry, um, rather than some of the other uh, sort of like textile and certain areas where you do see more um, night work, we've organized ourselves in a way that manages the time manager's headcount so that we don't have to go over um, those hours. We don't, I mean, we obviously, complying with the law is a basic thing for us. Um, so we've, we take that cost um, and we've factored that in to our structures and to our business plans. Um, in terms of other things like flexibility and part-time work, We've also worked very closely with the EFC, with legal advice, looking at how we can provide these things um, and come up with structures and frameworks to attract and retain more people, men and women both. But unfortunately for women, it's a decision of whether you stay in the workforce or not, if you have part-time or flexibility or not. So we've come up with structures and frameworks very carefully that we implement again with a lot of difficulty uh, because we want to have those different options. Um, other than that, of course, some of the things that we do are, like I've said before, childcare, we introduced paternity leave, um, adoption leave, other types of leave that are necessary for people to have better balance with their families and lives, um, education on um, harassment, awareness, preventing gender-based violence and harassment in the workplace and outside. It's a really sensitive topic, and I know the apparel industry is um, constantly under a spotlight. Um, but we have done a lot of work in terms of the frameworks we have, the speak-up methods we have, and the action we take. But again, um, a roadblock that we see is when we have to take action, um, the level of evidence uh, the way we have to manage the domestic inquiries, the way we have to handle the case. We, I have to say, in cases where we've had complaints of sexual harassment as a company, we've got legal advice and sometimes we've decided that even if we have to go to labor tribunal, pay compensation sometimes and take whatever consequences, we will take action because we want our workplaces to be safe. That's not an easy call for an employer to make. So. We've, we've, we try to manage. Thank you very much, Tanuja. Moving on to Ms. Ayomi. When we speak about making the policy and legal environment more conducive to women, where do you think Sri Lanka should start? Well, we've had a lot of time talking about this, right? Because if you take one particular piece of legislation, the Termination Act, for the last 55 whatever years, we've been trying to correct that, right? So I think if we want to really start this agenda, we maybe a starting point is to see where we went wrong, right? Why nothing has moved in this country. Or when it moves, why it moves in the wrong direction, right? Even when it comes to laws. Now I'll give you two examples. Okay, look at this last uh, labor, the law that the, was going to replace so many complicated labor laws that we had. It was supposed to streamline everything. Government changed, thing went out. Now I'm not saying that that law was perfect, right? It was far from perfect. Now, point two related to that, it was far from perfect because of a reason. It was rushed through without adequate consultation, right? Um, and even right now, I'm told one of the more recent laws on this retirement age and related to that, it's going to create a huge problem with certain interpretations that the Labor Department is already embarking on, right? So we have this absolute lack of 
planning, absolute lack of anything approaching a general plan that you can safely pass on. I mean, parliament has two sides, right? And at the rate they cross over, they should be very willing to come together on important things for the country, right? So, I mean, it is beyond belief how we have not, I wouldn't, we have regressed, I think, to a point, Ramani, of where we uh, just can't get ourselves out of this hole. But okay, we have to, right, for survival. So okay, like get together, see what went wrong in the past and why. Was it a lack of political will? Was it a lack of consultation? Was it simply a lack of seeing the whole picture, listening to the proper parties? Now, uh, the Honorable um, the Talatata Korala spoke about ILO Convention 190, right, on sexual preventing violence. Now, that is fine. I'm all for a law preventing sexual harassment in the workplace. But don't rush into these conventions just because trade unions tell you go, go, go. ILU tells you go, go, go. You're, they are going to tell you go and after that you're left carrying the can, right? And it's not easy, believe me. You ratify these things, there are consequences for the country. You have to do reports. You're hauled up to international bodies. You face a lot of flack. We learned that with the maternity benefits, Convention 183. We rushed in, ratified something without thinking of the longer term, how difficult it was going to be and who pays, right? And very conveniently, the government said employer pays, right? So similarly with this convention on, it's violence, remember, and violence is a much broader concept than just harassment, right? You bring that, you ratify that, and then what next? I'm told to some extent the labor department, the labor authorities already have had uh, a kind of pro the amendments in hand, what was going to happen when this uh, convention was ratified, and uh, uh, there was a mechanism to bring in complaints. Now, that is great, right? We need a mechanism. But no one among the employers knew that this mechanism was even ready. How is that? So I rest my case. So <laughs> there are many steps, but I, I mean, some of them seem so simple. But why hasn't it happened? Ms. Ayomi, uh, if you have any questions from the audience, we are very much happy to entertain those. Uh, if you can get a mic here for Mr. Murthaza. If you can first get a mic here for Mr. Murthaza, we can move on. Hi, yes, uh, could I ask a question? Or? Uh, yes, of course, then we can move on to Mr. Yeah. Murthaza. Sorry, hi, my name is Shifani, I'm a video journalist. Uh, I, have, I have a few questions, uh, but like, no pressure. Um, in the face of uncooperative law institutions or this stubborn refusal to reform 60-year-old laws, how does the corporate and private sector creatively give room or make spaces for women in the workforce to grow despite it? How do you deal with it as leaders within institutions, spe specifically in terms of protection against sexual harassment and ensuring fair promotions? That's one question I have. And the other one is, um, I was just curious, male dominance in workspaces uh, can affect gender, gender sensitivity. There's a boys club syndrome. So what are the challenges as a woman within the parliament, if you look at the parliament as a workspace, surrounded by mostly men who seem to have women very low on their priority list. And lately, everyone's been talking about the failures of the parliament. And there are a lot of public protests lately. Do you all find value in these protests? Thank you. Atukorada, do you wish to answer that question? <laughs> Being in parliament, of course, <laughs> as a woman, I think even uh, to be on our feet is also a struggle now. And we get so much of harassment and, you know, I, I, I don't think in when time to come, any decent man or a woman will want to go into parliament because that has become such a, uh, I, I, I think whenever like, you know, it has to be at least some kind of minimum qualification, just even their old, if they can have their old levels as minimum qualification, that will do something for a, become a parliamentarian to have a minimum qualification would do something even. Because uh, it's so unpleasantness and uh, really I have to like, I, I don't want to because I'm being a, a parliamentarian, I just don't want to uh, tell you exactly what we go through. Uh, but you know, I, I, I have been in government 
but really we did not feel it that much. Even before that we did not feel it that much. Right now it has become a really a very uh, sad <laughs> state of affairs within the parliament and uh, so our women uh, parliamentarians, mostly the people who represent the opposition get so much of harassment verbally and uh, we have taken this up to uh, with the speaker but nothing is happening so I am so sad to say this is the plight of the women caucus. In fact, irrespective of politics, irrespective of our own parties, we all got together at a certain uh, incident where our chairperson Dr. Sudarshani Fernando Fulle was very like she uh, stood on behalf of all the women inside the parliament but nothing happened. So this is what uh, it is uh, about uh, the other she wanted to know about the public and. If you push to answer that you can on the last quarter. I think it is about the I, private I, sector. Yeah, I, I think I answered some of that with, yeah. with what we do and how we, I just want to very briefly say that I think the private sector has found ways to progress and, and sort of manage our business um, within the frameworks that are there. And like uh, Dr. Gunz, like I said, um, there is a lot that we need to do. Um, and we've identified, so I mentioned things like childcare, um, facilities, infrastructure, lactation rooms to mentorship, sponsorship, um, flexible work arrangements, training and development work, specifically looking at how we move women from the different levels from the time you come into the factory floor to executive and management cadre. So there's a ton of work that's happening and a framework, for example, speaking on behalf of MAS, um, we have a program called, which is dedicated to looking at um, addressing gaps for women and of course on top of that the usual uh, learning and development work that happens for the entire workforce. Um, so I think we've, we've found ways to stay within the law and, and also I, I do want to say that uh, while, like I mentioned before also while the laws, the gender discriminatory laws particularly um, are a hurdle and, and they, they don't help and also specifically things like having no framework for part time and, and flexible work is an actual major challenge. Um, we have managed and the private sector has I think found ways to motivate, recruit and retain uh, people, men and women both um, through the many, many different initiatives we've tried. Can I add one thing uh, to what your question? I think, uh, okay, MBS is a really great example, but they are a huge company and uh, we, yeah, so sharing the experience is one thing. Uh, the other thing is um, like when talent is going to be a problem, right? So companies will have to go that extra mile to retain talent. And when you have more and more clever, committed young women coming into the workplace, they are going to want to retain you, right? So we also have to push them, maybe as groups of employers, maybe as some kind of think tanks like Advocata. But I mean, you need two hands to clap, right? The women also just have to hang in there. You have to keep making a noise and you have to keep pushing those boundaries. It's not going to be easy, but we've got to do it. Thank you very much, Ms. Ayomi and Honorable Atakorara. Thank you for your honesty for the previous question. Uh, I think Mr. Murtis, I had a question. Um, I actually had uh, three areas I would like to explore. First, I would like to put this question to the researchers. When you talked about this uh, gender discriminatory law, did you uh, investigate how these laws came to being in the first place? That if they are discriminatory, what was the context or cultural or historical context into which why these things came to be in the first place or maybe somebody in the panel has done that research and could hazard a guess? Uh, Mr. Moetza, we did not look into the historical context of how these laws came into being. However, if the panelists do have insight on the issue. For certain laws, we do look at the Hansard and we go into what went behind it. But I'm afraid shop and office employees that we just accept the fact that they are archaic, no longer relevant. 
Uh, but certain other laws, you definitely know that, uh, I mean, if you take the Termination Act, you know it was created due to a shortage of raw material, right? So like that, uh, probably protection, but I don't think at that point they even considered the, uh, verbalized the need to protect women because maybe there was even, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. there were very good women in parliament at that time, <laughs> as, as, right, just as you have right now, I'm sure, but uh, it was. <laughs> Consequences, or were there a conscious effort to put in some of these uh, laws? Or? I can't speak for who was there, but probably the protection part of it was conscious. The one aspect is you get a different set of laws for women working in white collar jobs under the Shop and Office Act, and then a different set for manual blue collar workers. I mean, this is, this is based on a very class, class bias distinction. The, the kind of no namahatyas and the, the rest. So, I mean, this is all outdated nonsense. Uh, we have to make sure that whether you, you are doing a blue collar job or a white collar job, you have the same rights. So, but of course, society was very different at that time. So, that is how these... These thing, they, people were paternalistic, they felt they should protect these women and never mind that they must, would be doing their own harassment at home with uh, and on the road and the Kaju girls, that's a different thing. You know, so it, it comes from a, a society which was not as open as it was now and which was very discriminatory. But as, as Ayomi says, I mean, those are not issues now, we just have to get on with it and change it and modernize and be able to make use of the opportunities that are coming because time is running out that is what we need to to remember because our population is aging we have to make the best productive use of the young people we have now otherwise within the next 10 years finished everybody is getting old Remember, Mr. Chaffee, just one minute. Uh, the shop and we took a lot of British laws. Now, the Shop and Office Employees Act was virtually a copy of the British Shops Act. So, once again, dinosaur out. I think it's similar to the law that does not allow a woman to buy araku. Uh, I think it must have been a Victorian era law. Um, because, yeah. and one of the things that confused, I used to be a director in a hotel company and there was an HR control audit. and. Somebody pointed out to me that, uh, you know, a server in the restaurant, they can't work past 10 o'clock. So most people here are eating till probably 11 o'clock. So what do you do with the shift, you know? You can't tell them to all go home. So most people violate. I don't think many people conform to that. My, my second question uh, was about, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges women have is how do I get back home from work? Uh, now we have uh, interestingly more women going on motorcycles and I think you may have benchmark in Vietnam you see all millions of motorcycles do you think that that is a game changer and it is supporting this issue of removing some of this discrimination because now people find it much easier to get back home any, I think any form of transport that women can have which is safe and of course, the motorcycle is is your your move traveling on your own. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for us, for example, we see so much of that even in the northeast. Um, so, do you have a sense? Have you ever done a survey to see how your workers get home? So, our workers are provided transport. Okay. So, our, our workers have safe transport uh, back and forth, uh, and for personal use, a lot of them do use motorcycles. But, but, but the fact that women now have personal transport means. Hasn't that significantly improved their flexibility to be able to go to work? Uh, I am not aware of any studies which have been done on that. But here again, we are, you know, public transport, safe public transport is a must. In the most developed countries, the rich people even use public transport. Here, the rich people use private transport. Singapore based its economic development on having a transport system which was safe for women and children. If they met that st standard, then that was fine. Here, we don't have that. And the other thing is, 
quite apart from harassment in the workplace and all that. Which woman would be uh, confident about going to the police, about a rape, about something else? Why? Because the powerful people are connected and they influence the, 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 the systems of justice and enforcing the law. Uh, I think you, you first have to ensure that people will have a good chance at getting justice in order to prevent harassment and, and the criminal activities which target women and which are condoned because of the connections these criminals have. Okay, so can I ask exactly. my last, yes. Sorry, please. I was just going to say. Um, safety on public transport is one thing, but honestly, sometimes you don't feel safe driving in your car <laughs> on the road after a certain time. Mm -hmm. So bikes, I, I mean, it's a matter of overall safety, I think, for women. Yeah, if you have a breakdown, who do you go to? What could happen to you? And also we have this paradox of we try to introduce the women-only buses. Miserable failure. So. Okay, my, my last question was about, uh, you know, about uh, harassment. You asked about women being harassed. Now, I'm coming from a business family also. And whether we have the law or we don't have the law, my belief is that uh, the owners or the leaders set the tone at the top. Do you think that in Sri Lanka, the leaders of businesses, the owners of businesses are setting the right tone at the top in terms of harassment of women in their establishments. Um, if things have changed a lot with social media, right? There was a time when I started, just before I started work, there were companies that you wouldn't send your daughter or sister to work. But I can't think of any companies like that offhand. And these were big companies, right? I won't mention names. Right? So I would say to some extent, because you're more accountable, uh, there is a certain, and also aware, I think most employers now know about sexual harassment. I mean, we, I, have, I used to do so much training and they bring in people to talk about it. So this fear factor is there. But then again, to going back to what you said, uh, who has the power, right? If you know the right people, you can probably rape half your workforce and get away with it. about pri the private sector, the harassment in government department, the harassment in the health sector. Uh, I mean, there are doctors also up to it. You know, so where do you manage to control this? Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it is the kind of behavior that males engage in. Some males have been brought up to behave in a certain way. Others have not. So really, that is where where the problem is. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramani. Ramani. You have a drastic attitude uh, change. This is the whole problem with our systems. <laughs> At least room for hope, I would say, with the millennials, and if nothing else. About ignorance of, about the laws. I think we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. I can see a lot of hands being raised. Uh, we have a few questions. I think one of the researchers um, wanted to clarify one of the points. Uh, Mr. Modusa, if I'm to answer um, your first question on why these laws were initially discriminatory against women, like I mentioned in my presentation, initially these laws were brought during the British rule intending to protect women. However, now uh, there have been instances where it was found that employers um, look at these laws as when it's like an additional cost to them when they employ women because sometimes they have to provide additional transport and other facilities like the consent factor and so on and so forth. And to answer your second question on the transportation factor under night work, we've uh, actually uh, addressed this in one of our reform recommendations and looking at other countries, uh, especially countries in India, um, sorry, states in India such as Kerala, Maharashtra, something that they've done when removing restrictions on night work for women is that they've um, ensured that the employer provide transportation to women employing at night. However, in Sri Lanka, we've understood the situation in our country and we make sure that the state also has a responsibility to, um, to ensure that um, 
they create a safe uh, space for women to uh, transport, like go from their uh, officers to their uh, residences. And yeah, that's what I have to add, Antiphony. Um, just to tackle the question in terms of the maternity benefits ordinance. So we did look into that when we were doing our preliminary research, right? And we identified that at the uh, when you look at the law itself, that means the maternity benefits ordinance itself, there is nothing wrong with the law. The things that need to change in terms of maternity benefits ordinance was tackled by another think tank, and we have sort of left that out in the uh, left that out from the report so it could be sort of taken up by that other think tank because that was their uh, uh, one of their main research pieces thank you i think we had a few questions from thank you very much for the researchers i hope that answered some of the questions uh, we have one more question there if we can get a microphone there Hello. thank you it's, it's not really a question, but more or less like a statement. Uh, at the end of the day, we discuss everything, but it all boils down to political will. Because these issues we've been talking for many years and why aren't anything gets done because there's lack of political will. So some at one point we say this is vested with the justice ministry, some say it's with the labor ministry and you know, we don't know who takes the final decision. And at the end of the day, if right people sit at the right place, these things will change. But what I'd like to request is what about participatory democracy? where we as, gov we as citizens, how can we contribute towards policy making? We see a lot of good work that has been done by organizations as yours. And, but, and you, there are many, many research reports that have been done. And what for policy formulations, what changes that needs to happen, we talk about it. But at the end of the day, it's all wasted and it's, it all boils down to a p person who's sitting in parliament. And a private bill is also not something that goes through. So how can we go in for participatory democracy? How can the judiciary contribute towards making legislature? It is not there in Sri Lanka, but it is there in India. But my sincere request to organizations as yours, Advocata, is to talk about participatory democracy and to talk about how policymakers, how the think tanks, how educated people can contribute towards policy making. Because parliamentarians, you cannot have faith in them because we don't have the right people sitting there. And we don't have people with even the qualifications who are, who are actually, who can actually govern us. So it is time that the educated people act in a manner that we can dictate terms. So one of the th suggestions I like to make is for us to talk about part participatory democracy and push, push for legislature where how we citizens can get involved in policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lahini Fernando, for your contributions. I think we had a few um, questions at the back. Uh, yeah, thank you. I actually have two questions. So the first one is about the private sector. Um, one of the things that came up in, in a lot of recent research with the COVID-19 pandemic is how manpower agencies and how they've capitalized on the labor supply to the FTZ and the free trade zone workers. Um, to what degree would these legal reforms protect those workers who come in through the manpower agencies who don't have a formal contract with whoever employs them, like the company where they work, the factory where they work? And uh, one of the biggest issues is the sexual harassment that these workers face, where there's not a lot of like liability on either side. So I'm wondering if this has been taken into consideration, and if so, to what degree? And the second question is uh, to... Uh, Honorable MP uh, Atako Rala. Um, I'm not going to disagree that things are really terrible right now in terms of you know, everything, uh, but I wonder, um, uh, only because you brought up how um, changing or reforming these laws is difficult because it also there's a significant level of influence that the Labor Ministry has. As a former Minister of Justice, I wonder what you can tell us about the manifest um, discrepancies when it comes to collaborative efforts between ministries like justice, labor, and women's affairs back when it was still a cabinet ministry and not just a state ministry. So those are my two questions. Thank you. If you wish to answer that question, the second question that you have. No, but the chicken. Okay, you can, yeah. uh, if you wish to take the first question in. I, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer the first question because well, the, we don't engage with manpower agencies. I think it's more around the, the legality of engaging with manpower agencies and what that does. I wonder if Prof Dr. Gunatilaka or Iomi, you might be better at response. All I can say is that uh, technically they have the same recourse to the law because after all, the employer is their employer, right? So if they have an issue, 
they can always go back and they'll have the same recourses the law. If it's sexual harassment, they, whatever limited uh, avenues are available to a normal employee, they would also have to go to the police or to whatever, try to complain to the labor department. I'm told the labor department, even if you complain, we'll tell you go to the police. Um, so that is about, and I would say also that, um, I mean, things, they, the companies also do not get even it involved even in disciplinary matters when the worker is sent through a manpower agency. They will put it back to them. Yes. Thanks. Just a quick follow-up question. Thank you for your answer. Um, only because they are not permanent, they're not counted as permanent employees. So I wonder if any legal reforms are brought in, whether there would be specific protections for these, specifically women who go through these manpower agencies. Because, um, you know, like empowerment within the free market is one thing, but when people capitalize on the free market and then exploit these women, it's a whole other thing. So that's just my question and something also perhaps for the researchers to take into account when they propose these reforms to look at these little niche gaps that might be missed out on. Thank you. This is my point of view, but I don't, I'm not sure whether giving them permanency because after all, we operate as employers, business owners, you operate in a very rigid uh, labor law framework, right? Basically your hands are tied, right? You go to LT. 10, 20, 15 years you spend, it's a cost. So this is just one way. I mean, if we had hire and fire and all that like that, if everything else was in place, maybe you could look at a different approach. So because of this lack of cohesion in approaching the problems that we have, you have piecemeal solutions, which unfortunately result in some people being uh, victimized or being really treated really unfairly. But I'm not sure just permanency, you can't just hand out permanency in the current uh, very uh, rigid framework that we have. It, I mean, the economy would go nowhere. And this is my opinion. I'm sure someone else might have a totally different opinion. About, uh, uh, laws that been draft, has to be drafted, uh, it's nothing to be done with the Ministry of Justice. It's an institution that comes under the Ministry of Justice, and that is the legal draftsman uh, department. And wherever any, 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 any statutory body or any uh, department that wants to create law has to send their proposals, the drafts to the legal draftsman, and then they are only, they create uh, laws accordingly. And that's how, uh, he, she wanted to know about the laws drafted, no? The difficulties in sort of coordinating, coordinating. between and managing those different yeah, so that's right. So whenever like uh, uh, any law being drafted, all these uh, institutions that has to come together and then they will decide at the end of the day, it's the legal draftsman department that uh, uh, has the responsibility in drafting laws and then it is being sent to the relevant uh, department or the uh, institution and then it gets uh, uh, presented to the uh, parliament. Honorable Atukorale, before we go into conclusionary remarks, we can entertain a few more questions from the audience. I think we have one question here and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, we talked about the lack of political leadership and then we talked about the need for uh, participatory democracy, but I think we are forgetting one layer there, which is the bureaucracy. See, all these policies really they should be pushing the politicians. We have the National Organization for Women, we have Women's Bureau. And I think we need to, in a report like this, we need to say what they have done in the past. We really need to put our agencies on the spot. They're really sleeping on the job. Um, second point I'd just like to make is, you know, we talk about double burden. There's a, a third burden that's been imposed on women, which is more and more of education of children is being really brought to the home. Right now, half, Children spend one day in school and one day at home. When they're at home, the parents should not be responsible. 7.30 to 1.30, the school should be responsible. So a third burden is really women are taking more and more of the children's education. So that's something, you know, not for discussion today, but we need to think about. Thank you very much for your insight, Dr. Gamage. I think we had one question over there, if you can get a microphone there. Um, hi. Um, so. Thank you for uh, enlightening us on these issues. Um, I have a question in terms of financial literacy, especially when it concerns um, 
blue collar workers. I was hoping uh, perhaps Dr. Ramani can enlighten us on that. Thank you. I haven't done any work on, on the financial literacy of blue collar workers. Uh, I can't think of anybody who has done either. Uh, maybe it's somebody who has done work on skills development or something. I'm sorry, I don't know anything about it, but you do raise a very important point. Uh, there was a study done, I think, on Middle East returnees and, and their financial re literacy. But apart from that, I haven't heard anything. Thank you for that question. If we have any more questions. Uh, just, just to make a comment on financial literacy, that's something we focus on in the training and development that we do for all of our blue collar workers. And, and it is, we see a huge improvement because we track the change. Uh, so in terms of savings, in terms of managing money, uh, and also looking after the family, uh, we, ask, we do see a huge um, positive impact. If we have any more questions, we you can raise them now. I think Professor Samarji will have one more question. I think the re report, I'm not uh, saying there was a, it was left out. The report was about the existing laws and the problems. But interestingly, uh, I think in Mangala Samarivira's 2018 budget, there was a proposal for enterprises with employee size of over 200 to be mandated to have childcare facilities. Now, I'm against unfunded mandates. But I think this is one that could be justified, particularly because there's that that lower le that level that was given. It didn't dump on some guy with ten employees, uh, saying that he should he should have a childcare facility. But for above two hundred, unfortunately, I don't think it got implemented. But as you move forward with this kind of thing, it might be useful to go back to that proposal and bring it up because there are well-meaning organisations that are currently doing it. But why not mandate it for the others? There were certain tax incentives that were also proposed in that same, uh, yeah, 20, 2018, I think. If you have any more questions, uh, we can entertain those questions now. If you don't, we can go into the conclusionary remarks of the panel. I don't see any questions being raised, so we can go to the conclusionary remarks of the panel. Dr. Gunatilaka, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking of what this lady said and also what the Honorable MP said. At the end of the day, uh, women need to have a voice in Parliament uh, and an educated voice. Uh, one way is for educated people to get into politics. The problem is educated people don't want to step into the ditch, most of them. So there's that problem. And even if they did, you know, getting nominations, uh, from the party leaders, it, it's impossible. Uh, one policy which was implemented recently, I, I think during the time you were uh, a minister, was uh, bringing that quota for local government. Uh, we need to get that kind of thing at the provincial level and the national level. It doesn't matter if relatives of MPs, current MPs and politicians get in. There has to be a start. Without that, minimum quotas for women's representation because they are disadvantaged. They can't be going onto the streets and uh, shouting filth at people and their families are not going to support that. There are a whole lot of barriers for women. That needs to be fixed. The other thing is the level of education of our MPs. They don't know what they don't know. Uh, I mean, it is frightening. We are entering a world uh, with all this, you know, fourth IR. I, I mean, I don't think they know what the first IR was. Uh, it's, it, we, are, we are in a, a, a vehicle driven by people without a license. Uh, so we really need to fix that. And, and fixing that is not enabling them to get any degrees from the state universities as was suggested. We, they really need to, be, to have minimum qualifications and retraining while they are in government. Thank you very much, Dr. Amini We appreciate your insights. Uh, Ms. Ayami, if you have any conclusionary remarks. It just sets things uh, 
we are talking about laws and discriminatory laws in particular. We do know that it takes a long time, looks like an impossible task, but I think we absolutely have to make a start somewhere. Uh, I'll be dead in 50 years, uh, but the young people sitting here, I don't want you all to sit here and say, I was at this Advocata thing in this year and we spoke about it, we are still talking about it now, right? So we all have a part, I think all of us here, we have worked towards this end. It's been slow, but it's still worth continuing with it and I hope you at least get there. Yeah. So we need to try and bridge whatever gaps we can, uh, because otherwise we won't move forward. Um, so that would be my, my final thought and my message to any company that can do whatever they can um, to bridge the gaps, to keep, to recruit the talent, retain the talent, uh, and support. I'll pass the and, uh, I think finally, when it comes to all these issues, whether it's uh, any gender discrimination or something else, I think our ignorance about laws is one particular area that we have to address from the uh, with the education if we can give them some kind of uh, knowledge about the legal systems and laws in this country there would be like uh, there wouldn't be any kind of discrimination uh, against anyone male or female but uh, very unfortunately we only uh, learn about our history, our geography, and other things. Also, maybe that we need them at one point, but then, like, uh, I think mostly, most of these people, we as lawmakers, I think everyone should, has a right to know about the uh, laws prevail in this country, so that should start with the education at one point, and I think, uh, this is what I finally think when it comes to all this kind of uh, discrimination and harassment and all that. Thank you very much, Member of Parliament. With that, I think we've come to the conclusion of our panel discussion. I thank um, Honorable Tata Tukorala for being here with us today, Ms. Thanu Dajayavardhana, Dr. Damani Gunatilaka, and Ms. Aimee Fernando. I know you have a very busy schedule. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedules to be with us here today. We highly appreciate it. And for everyone who's in the audience, thank you very much for accepting Advocata's invitation and being present here today. I do invite all of you to be a part of the cocktail and networking event that we have organized uh, post the panel discussion. Uh, I hope that uh, this discussion that we've had um, given that Women's International Day is tomorrow brought some insight into the de gender discrimination in Sri Lanka's uh, labor laws and we do invite you to uh, grab a copy of our report if you wish to do so please give in your names and your details and your email address and your contact number to any of the Advocata staff members we'll be happy to share a copy with you. Thank you very much and have a good night. <laughs>